The house stood about here. So many houses, so many names. Names which will mean nothing to you, gentle viewer, but for me are part of the very fabric of my life. Albert Drake, John Hughes, Jimmy Preston, who was considered a real boy and whom I envied. Barbara May, who, wearing a stiff dress with multicolored squares on it, would stand outside Charlie Burnell's shop and sing Danny Boy. Mary Carroll, whose hair I used to pull. All, all are gone. The old familiar faces. Your new film, The Long Day Closes, is partly about a boy discovering the cinema, and that's very important to the film. Can you remember when you discovered the cinema and the impact it had on you? Yes, I can remember it vividly. Um, I'd never been to the cinema at all before because I wasn't allowed out because my father was very, very strict, and he died in 1953 when I was seven. And my elder sister took me to the Odeon in Liverpool, and it was to see Singing in the Rain. And which was such a joy. I mean, the only thing I could remember um, was the, the, the title sequence, um, when he does the title. I just fell in love with the cinema then, uh, but I fell in love with American cinema. Um, I went, was then taken to see every musical that was ever made um, from then on, um, simply because my sisters loved American musicals, and of course so did I. And we'd even read the credits. I mean, my sister would say, I see Bud Westmore's done the makeup, and I'd say, yes, and that's fabulous. You know, as though we knew him. Um, but it was such a joy, because America was the land of magic. It was colour. Um, England was very grey. But the real, the real joy was seeing American musicals, and particularly Doris Day. Those films transformed your surroundings. Suddenly you saw them in a new light. Suddenly you'd look at the way the street was after rain, and it just seemed so glowing and wonderful. You mentioned that working class family. It was a large family. I believe there were ten children. Yes. And you were the youngest. Yes, I was. Your father died when you were seven. Your father was an extraordinarily brutal man. Well, he was, I, th I think, quite, quite mentally disturbed. And she was so bleeding. Um, uh, when he was younger, I mean, he just, he'd physically abuse people, and particularly my mother. No, 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 please, no, no, no. But the rest of us, I think, were um, mentally um, abused, in the sense that um, it was a kind of terror which reigned. Um, I could go into the parlour at four or five and I knew whether he's in a good mood or not and you know if he wasn't in a good mood and you could sense it like that what you did was you kept your head down and tried not to be noticeable I just remember being frightened all the time um, and um, then he began he began to get very ill when I was um, five and he died at home, he died of cancer, and it took two years for him to die. So what was also awful was the fact that, you know, uh, he was suffering from this stomach cancer, and those days, I mean, they gave you morphine, and it wore off, and they wouldn't give you another one till your next prescribed injection, and he would be screaming like an animal. <coughs> Do you have any feelings now? I mean, if you met him, would you, as it were, try to understand him, or would you try to... What would you do? I don't... I don't think I've reached a level of maturity where I try to understand him. Um, I went through a period when I was incredibly angry at what he'd done to my mother, because my mother's full of love, and to do that to someone I just think is... I think it's vicious. And I went through a period where I was just so angry that, I mean, had he been around, I would have killed him quite cheerfully choked him, um, because nobody should be allowed to um, do what he did to, not only her, to his entire family, because we've all been affected by that malign influence. He was a remarkable open interviewee. He wanted to talk about it. He has this shyness about him in his look. He had uh, uh, an enormous knowledge of film culture. He wanted to talk about film, about his passion for this, his passion for the subject, and his Roman Catholicism. This complicated, strange man who could remember accurately uh, every moment of every Saturday night. He helped his sisters to dress up to go out for their Saturday night dance and 
what was it did? Help them to rub brown stuff on their legs so they looked like stockings, something like that. <laughs> you remember it all. Uh, has produced uh, some of the more remarkable films uh, in British cinema, few though there have been. Well, did you get me stuff for me? Yeah, two pairs of nylons, 15 right. denier, yeah. well, a medical well towel, fully well, fashioned, well, right. pants there and nail well, wash. Majestic red? Yeah, yeah. imperial leather, picture go yeah, and picture show. Evening in Paris. Yeah, I like that, that. didn't have any. Oh. And then the, uh, the gate closed again when you went to secondary school. And I've read that you said that you think you were bullied every day you were at that school for the next four or five I years. Was, I was beaten up every single day. Who's a fruit, then? Hey, it's Al Capone, isn't it? Hey, your name's Al Capone, isn't it? <laughs> Al Capone? Yeah. <laughs> when you came from a Catholic family and went to a Catholic school, this is the mid-50s when I presume those schools were still rigorous and very Catholic prayers at the beginning and the end of the day. and. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of sin, a lot of confession, and so on. Did it uh, dominate your inner life, that Catholicism? I'm still full of do's and don'ts and oughts and ought not to's, because I, if I lie or, because I don't lie, I try to be as honest as I can, I know that God will know, and I don't even believe in him, and I know that he'll know. It's absurd. You never get rid of it. Surrounded by these images of high Catholic revival, you're impregnated with it from a very, very early age. And so it must go into your subconscious in some way and at such a deep level that you're not aware of it. Had you any ambitions to stay on at school? Or are these various forms of terrorization, internal and external, just put you off mm. the whole but, but business also, altogether? But also, I mean, in those days, you know, you left at 15, and, you know, the, the only kind of career guidance you got, you know, you, you went into the corridor, and this man from the Youth Employment Office said, um, uh, this is your academic record, you will go into an office, and I went into a shipping office, because that's what I was told to do. So I was there a year, and then I got into an accountancy practice, where I was there for a long time. For about 12 years, I'm yes. sure. Did you do anything at the weekend? No. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things I think about Davis is, is that for him, unlike L.P. Hartley, the past is not a foreign country. It's always there. It's always continuous. It's always with you. Just as you can be sitting in a room talking or listening, and at the same time, you're also a three-year-old somewhere else recalling that. And I think that sense of the fact that time is always there in the present, the past is always there in the present, is very strong in Terence Davis' films and often associated with movement and also with the Proustian Madeleine for Terence Davis is song, also associated with music and music that he uses in a very unironic way that absolutely summons up the past. It's a very considerable um, a success in terms of gongs and reviews and so on. I don't know what sort of financial success it was. Um, Neither do I. It's difficult to, <laughs> always difficult to get the figures back, isn't it? Did it sort of go to your head, Terence? Well, no, it came as a surprise. I mean, it came as a surprise because we were... Um, the biggest revelation, and it reveals more about my psyche than anybody else, is when we went to... We were invited to the Kanzen at Cannes, and I heard that we had to watch the film. And I thought, oh, God, I can't do that. I can't, I can't be doing with this. And I actually did toy with the idea of getting a sick note from my mother. But I thought, no, I will be brave. I will go. So only a few people walked out. There was quite a lot of applause, some bravos. And I thought, well, thank goodness, that's over. And then Pierre Delille said, oh, come out. Will you come out into the um, foyer of the old Quasette Cinema, which is the last no longer there? Some people would like to see you. So I said, yes, thinking about eight people. Well, I go out and it's crowded with cheering people. And he points to the stairs, which has got this red carpet down. And at first I thought, oh, God, he wants me to clean it. <laughs> and not a U-bank anywhere. And he said, no, you walked down. And so I did twice like the Queen Mother. It was absolutely wonderful. It was transcendental and came as a complete surprise. In the, uh, the Hollywood version of your story, having had a success with this voice as well, there you go, that's the rocket boost, got you out of the clammy Earth's atmosphere, you're now away there and more offers come, planets are conquered and so on. What, what really happened about putting the next film together? It was extremely difficult um, because of what I wanted to do, of course, um, in, in terms of narrative and the shots, it would made it very expensive. Um, and really, we should have had £2.2 million, and we couldn't raise it. We simply couldn't raise it. 
critical acclaim and prizes at international festivals at Cannes does not, of course, necessarily equate with commercial success. And I think Terence Davis has had a problem, I mean, clearly did have a problem between the end of the 20th century and later on in, into the 21st in getting the projects that he wanted to do made. Now, it's partly because his films do not have the kind of cheap consolation of the feel-good movies that a lot of financiers want. I mean, they're completely out of that fashion, and that was definitely the flavour at one point when he was trying to get films made. They tend to be personal projects. Uh, they tend to have sometimes this autobiographical content. But actually, I think maybe something that is more challenging for them is perhaps their style, because even people who absolutely love his films would say that they do meander sometimes. Now, that's partly the point of them. And the meandering, when it works, absolutely brings you back to a perfect spot. But it's not the conventional, necessarily conventional three-act structure. He wouldn't want that. Uh, and he writes them himself. He knows he has a very strong feeling for uh, how, they how they should unfold and when that perfect moment is. He talks about the resolution very often, like being like a musical resolution, that you know when it's right which is a strength in him as a filmmaker, but I think it makes the project sometimes a bit more challenging. Eventually, Terence Davies did manage to raise the money for his second feature, The Long Day Closes, which involved recreating the entire street of his childhood home. The film further established him as an important British auteur with a distinctive visual style and a unique way of presenting memory. It's very difficult to know how, if one does have a style, how that evolves, because you're so close to it. If there is a style, then I think there will be certain things which recur. Like, I, I love dissolves, but 96 frame dissolves, mm. because they're the longest ones and I like them. <laughs> you know, so I would, I, I would very rarely use a short dissolve, mm. because what's lovely about um, a four-second dissolve is you get an after image of the previous image that's actually going out. You just see it for a moment, and then it goes, and I think that's just fabulously moving for me anyway so I would always uh, I would always use those that length dissolve um, I like to track but only when it's right when you track um, you're making a huge visual statement not just getting from one part of the set to another um, and what I like um, is the idea of the denial of geography both emotional and physical <laughs> If you're tracking and you travel left to right, the feeling is that you've gone forward in time. If you track from right to left, you always feel that you've gone backwards in time. Because we don't read that way. So tenderly. When a track is used properly to reveal something emotionally and visually and geographically, it is terribly exciting because you don't know where you are and then you do. Or you know where you are and then at the end of those series of tracks you might not know where you are, which is even better. The reason we shot it in the studio is because all those places now are gone in Liverpool. They're all pulled down. Yeah, it's far up. It's far up. And I can't find streets that look anything like the one I grew up in. So that was the reason why we had to recreate it. Well, the scene we did this morning was a, con a conflation of uh, several uh, visual and emotional memories. Um, I used to watch my brothers mend their bicycles. I could never understand how a, a puncture kit worked. It's still a complete mystery to me. Um, and so I remember them making th th these, these repairs to the bike, watching them, and then watching them ride up the street with their friends. And I wanted to conflate that scene um, so it was both a literal memory and an emotional memory as well. Because as I say, I do remember atmosphere and emotions with incredible accuracy, actually. I don't think I've got a photographic memory, but I've got a, a, a photographic emotional memory. You take, take it slowly, there's nothing to do, nowhere to go, you really want to go with him. Don't, and don't rush it, don't rush it at all. And when you do this, then touch that, and then do that, not this, then that, it's too much. Just once, that, and then do that. Action. Are you going to cast Iron Chalk, Ev? 
No. Walton Woods? No. Walton Woods. Are you going to crash the Iron Shore, Kev? No. Walton Woods? Can I go with you? I haven't got a bike, bud, lad. I think his life's changed now a lot for the better. He's found somebody he, he's in love with, is the way he describes it, which is charming, and that is reciprocated, so that's fine. Um, more than fine. Lucky. Uh, he's back on track after a long absence. He's got a new film just come out. He's got other films under his belt in the, in the works. But there's a long time he couldn't get anything going. I mean, David Putnam uh, lodged him down at a house in uh, the country that David had at that time, gave him a place to live where he could write. And he seemed to be a lost soul, one of those uh, working class stars who shine and then uh, go out or are put out one way or another. And yet something about his spirit and his determination has kept coming through. He's a remarkable man. Uh, it doesn't always happen, in my experience, that remarkable men make remarkable films or that remarkable films are made by remarkable men. But in Terence Davies's case, those two fit. Do you have a commercial market in your mind when you're making films? No, I have no idea where they go anymore. It's not like a captive audience as it was when I was growing up, where you just went anywhere because, you know, all there was was the radio and there was the cinema. And if you were grown up, there was the pub and the dance hall. Does this mean that you, you, you see filmmaking as a much more, what our generation thinks of, much more European, more private, more personal activity, nearer to writing poetry or writing a novel? Well, I mean, my feelings really are mixed. I mean, I'd love to make a musical. I mean, I'd love to make a romantic comedy. I want to make a thriller. Whether I'll be able to, I don't know, but that's what I want to do. I'd love to make a musical with 150 girls coming down, uh, with, oh, preferably 150 men coming down in tights and top hats. That would be really good. Um, but I, I, that's not the way I see my own cinema. I mean, I hope that doesn't sound too pretentious, but I, I see it as an expression of what I need to say. Now, that, in a way, is private. It's much more subtle. It's much more... It's on a smaller scale. But because it's a small scale, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to, have to be small. It can be on a grand scale emotionally. You know, you can say important things by concentrating on the small. That's what Chekhov did. And again, I wouldn't dream of comparing myself to Chekhov, but that's what he did. Um, and I think you can do that for ordinary people, because I do passionately believe in the poetry of the ordinary. I really, really do. do. Well, the fact that you don't have, to, you know, the majority of us don't see car chases every day or mass murderers or people being blown to bits in slow motion. We don't. Our lives are much more ordinary than that. But what's important to us, if we're from an ordinary family, is that someone gets married or has a kid um, or dies. They're big, in, big things. Someone moves house. It's important. And I find that immensely moving because it's, it's small, but it has... We can all share that. We all know what it's like to feel joy at someone getting married or having a child. We can all feel the pain of people dying. We all share that. 